Good morning. If you would please stand and uh, join with us for our call to worship this morning. Uh, if you've got a Bible with you, please open, if you can, to Psalm 150. We'll be reading Psalm 150, verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with the loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has life and breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is his word. Amen. pray together. Father, we thank you for giving us the very breath in our lungs so that we may praise you. And fathers, we have gathered this morning as your people. Uh, we gather in a spirit of thanksgiving and of praise. And so Lord, as we start our gathering this morning, I pray that you would just ready our minds, ready our hearts, ready our, our very breath to just give all that we are this morning. Our, our focus, our attention, our heart, our mind. Lord, may you have absolute, um, just absolute control over us this morning as we sing your praises, as we submit ourselves to your word, as we just look to be nourished by your word, to be filled by your spirit, and to be equipped and encouraged. Lord, we thank you for the breath that you've given to us. Lord, this morning, may we use it to praise and glorify and exalt you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
And good morning, all of you. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship gathering of Olivet Baptist Church. If you're with us this morning as a guest, we want to wish a, a very hearty welcome for you. Hope that already as you've walked in here, you've felt uh, warmly welcomed. Uh, we want to take some time at the end of our gathering, hopefully to catch you and just uh, say hello to you. We would invite you to fill out one of those Connect cards on the pew in front of you. Shouldn't take you much time at all. And uh, before you head out of here, you can fold that up and just place it in our offering box there. Um, as we continue this morning, we just wanted to give kind of an update on things because over the last week or two weeks, especially for, I don't remember, it, it, I, I'm, it feels like a long time ago and then it feels like just yesterday and I, I'm sure it feels like a whole lot of things for Matt and for Aubrey. But uh, we spent about a week solid praying faithfully for Cade, for his life and for their family and God just answered so many prayers. And so Matt and Aubrey uh, are going to come this morning and just give an update on how they're doing, how Cade's doing, and then Sean uh, Newman, one of our pastors, is going to come and pray for them. My wife loves uh, speaking in public. We're going to share, try to be brief, <laughs> with our story. Um, two weeks ago today, we made a trip to urgent care, which turned to the emergency room because something wasn't quite right with Cade. His respirations were very rapid and shallow, and his feet turned blue for a little while. Um, at the emergency room, uh, first of all, I'm going to be talking a lot about oxygen levels. Um, 90, it's... Your oxygen saturation is how much oxygen is in your blood. We want it above 90. It's usually typically high 90s unless there's a problem. Below 90 is not good, and lower than that is bad. Um, when we got to the emergency room, he was between 80 and 85. Um, they gave him a breathing treatment and oxygen, and over the pa over the next like four or five hours, he continued to decline. They kept increasing his oxygen support and it was not keeping his oxygen level at a safe place. And so the uh, pediatric intensive care doctor came and told us that they're taking us up there and they needed to intubate him. His body was just tired um, from working so hard to breathe um, and he needed a break. His body needed a rest. Um, I thought that was the scariest time of my life, <laughs> watching them intubate him because they had a difficult time. Um, it took multiple tries and his oxygen level would drop, drop, drop while they're working on him. And God answered our prayers and they got him taken care of. Over the next two days, they were working on um, uh, fixing his lung. Basically, they thought it was like he tested positive for a cold virus, and they thought that, that that was causing swelling and inflammation in the lung and gathering mucus, so he basically was only using the left lung. His right lung was completely not working. Um, but he continued to improve over the two days. His lung was would be clear. They aggressively worked on it with treatments, and it was getting better. So Wednesday morning, the plan was to work on extubating him at six. Um, at three, a little after three, one of the treatments, he there was something wrong. I will spare you the mental image. <laughs> they basically proceeded to work on saving his life for the next two and a half hours. And I don't have words to express how terrifying that was. Um, the, the breathing tube was blocked. They, it was a process of first trying to figure out what was wrong. Why was his oxygen dropping? Why couldn't he breathe with a ventilator? Um, they tried to intub they tried reintubating him again. They couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> they finally were able to call an anesthesiologist who was able to. And his oxygen level in the span of two and a half hours, uh, at one point it was zero and off the monitor. For a long time, it was 30s, 40s, 50s, which is not good um, because then we're 
talking about injury. And um, we had, Matt was on his way. We had friends on the phone with me praying, just like literally laboring in prayer. And I just remember as the doctors were working on him and nothing was working, I just remember we were praying like, Lord, you are the God who spoke the world into being. Please speak life into our baby. Lord, you are the God who breathed life into Adam, who breathed breath into Adam, breathed breath into our baby. And you are the God who healed with a touch and a word. Please heal our baby. And just praying protection over him. The doctors, it's not working. Nothing is working. Like, you do it. You breathe into him. You give him the oxygen he needs. You heal him. Um, it got to the point where they finally were able to intubate him again. They were working on ventilator settings that were too high for his body to sustain, but they were just trying to do something. They did an emergency bronchoscopy, which the surgeon, they called up a surgeon and they um, warned us, like, they're, they're hoping to remove a mucus plug. So before it was the right lung that was clogged and not working, then during that morning it was the left lung that was not working, it was blocked. So they were hoping to go in and physically remove the mucus plug. And she said it sounds really easy, but it is very dangerous and he may not tolerate it. So then it was two, two hours of waiting. Um, and at that time we felt God praying, God calling us to pray Mark 1124, which says, uh, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have already received and it'll be yours. And so we just felt led to pray, like just in faith. We didn't know what was going to happen, but we just felt led to pray in faith, Lord, heal our baby. We're going to believe that you're healing him. Thank you for healing him. Thank you for saving him. And I know that I don't understand prayer completely. Sometimes God doesn't answer the way that we hope, but we felt led to do so, and they came back longer than the scheduled time, and they found a foreign body. <laughs> they couldn't get it out. Um, They're like, we need to get it out. We don't know what it is, but we need to get it out. This is, it's dangerous. His oxygen levels were low. Um, and we kept praying just, Lord, thank you for saving him. Thank you for saving We believe that you are God who answered, who fulfills your promises to us, and this is what you say in your word. Save him. Thank you for saving him. And about 15 minutes later, <laughs> they pulled a light bright peg from his lung. He had inhaled it. Um, so we were thrilled, obviously, but then the next challenge was possible injury to his brain because he went five hours plus without adequate oxygen levels and they were very concerned. So we continued to pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for protecting him because we prayed while his oxygen levels were low that God would protect him, protect his brain, protect his body. The next day, they, they woke him up on Wednesday a little bit to see if we could see some signs that there was damage or not. And we saw some hopeful signs. He was responding to painful stimuli. He, he turned to the sound of my voice. So we just continued to pray. And the next day they intubated him, or extubated him. And uh, after, after a while he woke up and he was looking at us. But I knew he was okay when I gave him to Matt to take a turn to hold him, and he turned around and reached his arms out for me. <laughs> and, I, that, yeah. and I asked the respiratory therapist, can you reach your arms out and see, like, does he really know who I am, or does he just think, you know, I'm just, a, a woman is a mom? So she tried it, and he didn't reach out for her, and I did it again, and he reached out for me. So we, uh, there was still a question after that, whether there would be injury. But over the next week, um, he's completely regained all of his strength, obviously. Everything is normal. So God truly answered the doctors. The doctors 
call him a miracle. There were doctors and staff members praying for him, telling me after he was off the ventilator, I'm so thankful he's okay because we were really worried and things were very serious. The doctor, I had told the doctor how scary it was watching my baby almost die for two and a half hours. And he said, I don't mean to scare you, but that was very accurate. It, things, it was very serious. He was very close to death and God truly did answer all of our prayers all over. <laughs> and it's just overwhelming. Yeah, and I'm just gonna say real short, she did a much better job than I would have done with all that speaking of what happened, but I just also wanted to express my gratitude and thanks to everybody that was praying for this little baby and praying for us. I could sit here and tell you story upon story of what God had done, and I hope to share some of those things with you guys, but God literally woke people up from their sleep in the middle of the night two or three different times to call Aubrey and to pray at a time that she needed somebody. Um, so where things were dangerous in the middle of the night and the O2 was dropping, um, God literally woke up his people and prayed, you know, reached out to Aubrey. Um, so we can never say thank you enough. We know without a doubt, you know, which we've already known that we serve a God who is able and a God who is strong to save and he listens to our prayers and he healed our baby boy. And we just thank you all for your love and support and all the good meals we've been receiving. I joked with Aubrey, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask for that for two more weeks, you know. There was a verse I wanted to share that has brought encouragement to me. In 2 Corinthians 1, it's talking about how, you know, um, God comforts us in our suffering and we can comfort others, but, you know, this was this was the worst experience I've ever been through. It was the hardest. There were times I felt like I was physically dying because I couldn't take a moment more. And, you know, a lot of people think, you know, oh, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. But that's not actually what scripture says. And there's a passage, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8. Paul's saying, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, which was the, our weak. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted through the prayers of many. I feel like that was like our <laughs> passage of our week. Well, thank, you. thank you guys. We love you all. Appreciate it. Let's, let's pray a prayer of thanksgiving and, and a prayer, a continued prayer for the Allen family. Heavenly Father, it's, uh, you are a great, mighty, amazing God. Lord, I thank you for this testimony of faith, this faith story that's, that's so uh, recent. Um, Lord, I'm, I'm, my heart just praises you to see Kate up here wrestling around <laughs> Uh, trying to get the microphone. And Lord, we, we, I'm so thankful for answered prayer in this way. Lord, I know that you love Cade more than his parents do, more than we do, more than um, you, you knit him in his mother's womb, Lord. And I, we're so thankful. We praise you. We lift up praise to you that um, you saved his life in a miraculous way, Lord, that the testimony is not just here amongst our church family, but goes even to the doctors and nurses who are there the whole time. I, I thank you, Lord, that um, just as, as the verse that Aubrey just read, um, I get to voice thanks to you because of this miracle. And Father, I, I too praise you for just the way that I see the, our, our church family um, gather around the Allens as they, they labored in prayer, as many who stepped forward and took care of the kids provided meals, uh, little things compared to uh, 
Lord, your work. But Father, um, ways in which the, the body of Christ shows itself through action. So Lord, we continue to pray for Kate. This that you would continue to grow and mature him. Give his body the strength he needs. Protect him from sickness. Um, just as he heals, Lord, I, I pray for his future as well, that this would be a spiritual marker in his life, both for Aubrey and, and Matt but and their family, but also for Cade, just that as he's told about this story and, and reminded, Father, that he realizes your great hand on him. And Lord, I, I look forward to rejoicing and praising you in the future as we see uh, you grow Cade into somebody who just uh, testifies to you. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. scripture from Micah, the seventh chapter, 18 through 20. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will gain, have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and, step, and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old.
I invite you to take your Bible and open with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, if you're new to the Bible, make your way to the back right part of the Bible. You've got the Old Testament, which is most of it, and then you've got the New Testament there at the back, and we're at the very beginning of the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. Looking specifically This morning, as we continue our study through the Gospel of Matthew, we are in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, Jesus said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask in the mighty, compassionate, saving name of Jesus Christ, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would help all of us this morning as we spend time in this passage to understand more deeply and more clearly the heart of Christ for sinners. And God, that you would give us, your people, this very heart, this very mind. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, this week, as I have done for the past five years, I will be attending, it's a mouthful, I will be attending the Charles Simeon Trust Expository Preaching Workshop hosted by First E. Free over on the east side. And uh, this is an event that every year, it got canceled last year, so technically I guess not the last five years, but been five years, COVID canceled us last year, 
And this is one of the events in my schedule. You probably have events like this in your schedule that show up annually that you just look forward to, like family reunions and such like that. No, I'm, uh, but this one is it's one of those events in my calendar that uh, every year, I mean, it is circled, it's, it's highlighted. I look forward to it every year. Number one, just for the camaraderie and the rich fellowship that comes with being able to gather with pastors in our local area that, that likely I usually see maybe once or twice a year. And so it's just a rich time for that. But it's also just a wonderful opportunity every year to, to kind of go back to Hoosiers, uh, if, you, if you know the classic movie. It, it's a wonderful time every year just to go back to the basics. It, it, it serves as kind of a, a refresher course for me in preaching to revisit some of the basic truths and principles that should ever guide me in my preaching. In baseball terms, since I've hit basketball, let's go to, it's like spring training. What do the, what do the pros do who can hit the long ball, who can throw a perfect zip from shortstop to first base, who can, who can turn a double play with their eyes closed? Every spring, they show up to spring break, and what do they do? They, they go back to the basics. They get in the batting cage, or not the batting page, but they take batting practice. They, they do the basics. And this morning, as we study through Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, my hope is that our time together will be kind of like spring training. It'll be kind of like this preaching workshop that I will be going to this week. My prayer is that our time in these sh this, this short passage will serve as a refresher course for us as a faith family on the heart of Christ. That it will be something, it'll be a text that just takes us back to one of the most basic things about Jesus Christ, that whether you realized it this morning or not, that you need to regularly remind yourself of. And, and, and I said it's basic. It is one of the most basic things about Jesus and following Jesus. It's one of the most basic things about His heart and his mind. And that basic thing is that Jesus is a pursuer of sinners. He is a pursuer of sinners. And interestingly enough, in our passage this morning, I don't know if you, you saw it when we initially read through it, Jesus, he not only gives us one example of this fact that he pursues sinners, he goes ahead and he gives us two examples. And I want to highlight those two examples with you this morning. The first example he gives us that he is a pursuer of sinners is the example of my namesake, Matthew. Matthew. Look at verse 9 with me again. It says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Now, what do we know about Matthew, who in Mark and Luke is also referred to as Bible trivia, Levi? What do we know about Matthew? Well, it would appear, just from looking at Matthew's own account, because this is the Matthew who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, it would appear that Matthew, above everything else, he wanted us first to know that he was a tax collector. Interestingly enough, isn't that what men often do? You know, when, when women introduce themselves and they're getting to know each other, maybe it takes this kind of route. When men introduce themselves, it's, hey, I'm Matthew, and we kind of exchange some things. And what's usually the first question that we ask? What do you do? So Matthew, he introduces himself like kind of the stereotypical man, and he says, hey, I'm Matthew, and I was a tax collector. Now, what do we know about tax collectors. We know a lot of things about tax collectors back in that day, but let me just narrow it down to two things. As a tax collector, that meant two basic things about Matthew, the gospel writer. Number one, he was wealthy, and number two, he was hated. Let's talk about his wealth. Being a tax collector back in those days, it was a lucrative business. Now, he was working for Rome, and what he would do, he's kind of like a Roman IRS agent, he would go around and collect taxes, and if you were a tax collector in that day and time, Capernaum, right there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, it, it was a major bustling port city. So if you were a tax collector, and there would have been a long line of 
in that day, if you were a Jew, scumbags, who wanted to be a tax collector, you would have wanted to be in Capernaum because it was a city of just bustling trade and imports and exports and all these things, and it would allow Matthew a wonderful opportunity, just in addition to taking the standard taxes from each of you, he would have uh, maybe skimmed a little off the top. And maybe if he was only required to take 3% or 6%, or if you brought in something really nice uh, from the Sea of Galilee uh, across the shore, maybe it was supposed to be 7%, but he was going to tell you, uh, yeah, that's 10%, and he would take the extra 3 Matthew was a man of means. And we even see this, we get a, a little glimpse into this, just by the fact that he throws a party here in these following verses. And to throw this kind of party, and Luke, Luke, I'm going to read the account of Luke here a little bit later, we're going to see that to throw a party that was this big, to be able to host the amount of people that he hosted, to, to throw a kind of feast that Matthew threw for his friends, you had to have some money. The Costco bill would have been very large. And so Matthew was a man of means. He was also, though, a man of ill repute. In the Jewish mindset, for the Jews, a guy like Matthew was the scum of the earth. He was a traitor of the highest ranks. Like I said earlier, not only was he an IRS agent, which, you know, even just think in our day, it, that's kind of bad enough. No offense if you know anybody who's an IR agent. I'm just saying, stereotypically, this is how we think about you. It's bad enough to be an IRS agent, let alone to be a Roman IRS agent. Matthew, by being a Roman tax collector or a tax collector for Rome, would have meant, and again, you're thinking through a Jewish mindset, he was regularly associating with Gentiles, and he was working for and, and taking taxes, taking, taking advantage of his own people for the sake of Rome. And like I said earlier, Matthew, if he was anything like his counterparts, he was taking advantage of you if you were in Capernaum. For his own pocketbook. So, from a, Jewish count, uh, from a Jewish mindset, I could go on further about how he would have been seen as a scum of, uh, of all the earth, but from a Jewish mindset, Matthew was unclean in every single sense of the word, both ceremonially and culturally, which I think makes Jesus' statement to Matthew in the rest of verse 9, all the more astounding. Look at what he says in verse 9. It says, And he said to him, Follow me. Now let me ask you something real quick. Why Matthew? You ever thought about that? I mean, because if you're following in line, you, you have to keep account. You have to keep aware of the fact that Matthew, the gospel writer, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he's taking you through his own account, and he's saying, Hi, I'm not going to tell you much about me. I was a tax collector. And immediately, if you're thinking from a Jewish mindset, like I've labored to, to help you see, it would have been like, Whoa! Kind of like he's done in Matthew chapter 8. It's almost like Matthew's leading us up. There's a lot of unlikely people that Jesus is associating with leading into this passage. Lepers and Gentile servants and, and all these people. Demoniacs. So my question to you, putting your thinking, your biblical thinking cap on, why Matthew? Matthew. Because as I said, Capernaum was a bustling city port, a port city. Tons of people. And if you'll take your mind back in the Gospel of Matthew, where we are in the timeline of Jesus' popularity and his ministry and just that timeline, he is viral. Everybody knows about him. He is the talk of the region. He's the talk of, certainly of Capernaum. Everybody knows about Jesus and what he's done, casting out demons and healing people right and left. Everybody knows is following Jesus or in the know of, of what's going on. So out of all of the people in Capernaum, out of all the crowds that have been following him everywhere he goes, ooing and awing and showing so much interest in Jesus, my question to you, brothers and sisters, is 
Why Matthew? Think with me about how many people Jesus made his way past through the city streets of Capernaum to walk up to Matthew's tax booth. Why Matthew? Why would he go, if you're catching it, why would he go to the one man that wasn't going to him? In fact, what did Matthew say about himself? Was he, was he standing around the crowds? Was he standing even? He was sitting, for heaven's sake. Look back. Look back at verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, and remember, the crowds are just following him. He's the talk of the town. He saw a man called Matthew who was just constantly barraging him around the crowds. No. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth. So I'm just asking you, why would Jesus go after Matthew? Why would Jesus do that? And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus pursues sinners. And notice he doesn't just pursue sinners. He pursues even the most unlikely sinners. The sinners that you and I and the Jews of that day would least expect. If you would have said, all right, he's called Peter and Andrew and James and John, kind of questionable guys, fishermen, really, okay, take over. You know, they're going to start a revolution. Uh, we'll get back to that. All right, who's the next guy? All right, who, who's the next guy you're going to draft, right? Even for Peter, James, and John, if Jesus would have, I, I'm kind of using my sanctified imagination here, but knowing how tax collectors would have been viewed, if Jesus would have come to Peter, James, and John, the first four disciples, and he would have said, all right, uh, we're going to call a fifth, and uh, I, I know who I have in mind, but I'm just curious, who, you got, who should we draft? They're around, the, you know, they're, they're around the conference table looking at the rosters and all these things. Who should we go with? And maybe Peter says, well, hey, I know this scribe. This scribe, man, he's learned. He's got two, two PhDs, one in the Old Testament, one in Hosea. He's kind of interested. He's been, when you healed those de demons, he was there. I saw his face, man. He's blown away. He, he's been asking questions. There's this other guy, Nicodemus. Pretty, pretty influential guy. Hey, maybe him. What are you thinking? And Jesus says, you know what? I, I was actually thinking, uh, you, actually, you guys know this guy. Um, he's one of the local tax collectors, uh, Matthew. <laughs> And I'm just imagining that in that conversation, even for these deadliest catch kind of fishermen, rough, gruff, bearded, smelly guys, they likely would have responded with, huh? <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, wait. If, if we're about to start a movement here, like a revolutionary movement, Jesus, let me just uh, enculturate. You're not from Capernaum originally, but let me just know, tax collectors, uh, that, that, that's, that's probably not the route you want to go. And yet we see here, Jesus pursues not just sinners, but even the most unlikely of sinners, those that we would never choose, those that you and I would look over and look past, those that aren't even pursuing him, even in the least bit, Jesus loves and delights not only to pursue these people, but we see to save them. And I would just wonder, brothers and sisters, as we're thinking about this and meditating on this, I just wonder if there is someone in your life like that right now. Someone in your life, in your friendships, in your family, at your work, in your class, in your neighborhood, someone that you're associated with, that when you think about it, that person, those people, are they're some of the most unlikely candidates for following Jesus. And I hope you're already seeing from this passage that that person, those people, they are just the kind of people that Jesus delights to call to himself. Frankly, some of you might be here today and you might view yourself that way. You're not a follower of Jesus and you're like, man, I am. <laughs> I'm one of the most unlikely candidates to follow Jesus. 
Maybe it was the way I was raised, or maybe, frankly, you're like, if, I, if, if, if Matthew, if you knew my life and you knew what I've done, you knew the kind of things that I've done and the thoughts that I have and the, the, the just burden of guilt that I carry around, I'm the least likely, and I would just say good news for you this morning is that you're the exact kind of person that Jesus Christ pursues and loves to save. So Jesus comes up to Matthew, who's just sitting there on his iPhone, checking his bank account, looking at how big his funds are, and he says to him, follow me. And if you'll note, talking about the first four disciples, this was the very same call that he issued to Peter and Andrew and James and John. But I will tell you, that, that the, even though it was the very same call that he issued to those first four disciples, the implications for Matthew were much more severe. Why? Because if the whole following Jesus gig really didn't work out for Peter and Andrew and James and John, what do you think they'd go do? Ah, let's go fishing. In fact, they did it later in the Gospels. They did it. Things weren't kind of working out. Peter, you kind of get the sense that Peter's like, ah, I'm going to just, let's just go fishing. Let's go back to the business. If the whole following Jesus gig didn't work out for Peter and his crew, they just go back to fishing. Their dads would probably love to have them back in the family business. But Matthew? If Matthew walked away from tax collecting, number one, he couldn't just go back to collecting taxes. As I said, this was a job, even though people hated tax collectors, it was a job that had the moolah. And so there was a long line, especially for a city like Capernaum. So if he leaves tax collecting and the following Jesus gig doesn't pan out like he thought, he couldn't just go back to collecting taxes. And secondly, if he found himself unemployed in a primarily Jewish context, Who's going to hire a former tax collector? Who, what kind of work is a former tax collector going to get? So the, the call to follow Jesus, it was costly for all of them. Don't, I'm not minimizing that. I'm just saying it was extremely costly for Matthew. It involved a clean break with his position, with his privilege, and with his possessions, in short, it cost him everything. And what was his response? We notice in the rest of verse 9, Matthew, a man of few words, says, and he rose and followed him. Notice his response was immediate, and it was all-encompassing. He put down his ledger, he got up, and he followed in the footsteps of, of Jesus. In Luke's words, he says, and leaving everything, he rose and he followed him. And little did Matthew know, because I'm just trying to put myself in Matthew's shoes when he makes that decision. Could you say, man, that sounds so immediate? Well, likely, Jesus, like I said, he was the talk of the town. Matthew knew who Jesus was. It's likely that Matthew had been at least in some of the crowds and watched what had happened. Maybe, maybe the healing that we studied last week, maybe Matthew was one of the guys crammed into the house, or he was right outside trying to just peek through the doorway as Peter's roof gets torn open and this guy comes down and Jesus heals him. But I just have to think that when Matthew made that decision to close his ledger, to get up, and just to leave the tax booth by itself and to follow Jesus, I have to think that at least one of the thoughts running through his mind was, this is it. All my money, all my fame, all my position, all my privilege, you know, I... This is it. I may be making one of the most foolish decisions of my life. And little did Matthew know that this decision to leave it all behind that one day would result 
in him writing one of the most famous pieces of literature in the world today. That halfway around the world, some 2,000 years later, people in this little windy corner of the earth, this, this little church called Olivet Baptist Church, would be reading his account of coming to faith. Jesus pursues sinners. Matthew is a testament to it. And notice in verses 10 through 13, his friends are a testament to it. Did you notice what Matthew did right, right after becoming a Christian? Did you notice? Luke makes it a little more apparent, but what did Matthew do right after becoming a Christian? Did he go uh, to the east side, to Mardell, get him a good study Bible, get his name etched on it in cursive, you know? What did he do? You say it as holy as you want to say it. He threw a party, all right? And if, and if you want to say it in, in more raw terms, uh, there was probably alcohol involved. Remember, these tax collectors were shady, scumbag kind of guys. He threw... Maybe this is taking it a little far, but just to get your attention, wake you up. He threw a kegger. Probably not a kegger. But he threw a party. First thing, he comes to faith in Christ. He's baptized. I don't know. It doesn't say that. He follows Jesus, and he throws a party. <laughs> Luke, relaying the same story, look at how Luke says it. He says, And Levi, i.e. Matthew, made Jesus a great feast in his house. Notice not just the feast. He didn't have finger foods. He didn't, he didn't put out there some horse divorce, you know. A great feast. A lavish feast. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. I think Luke is, I, I think Luke is, is, is intentional. It wasn't just a feast. It was a, it was a huge party. There weren't just a few tax collectors there. It was a large band of them reclining at the table with them. In, wor in the words of Matthew, put your eyes on verse 10. It says, And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were, were, were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Now listen to me. If, if Jesus' if Jesus's association with, with Matthew was controversial. Matthew's association, uh, Jesus' association with Matthew's friends was extremely controversial. And, and, and not, only was, not only was it controversial that, that he's associating with these guys, not only is he talking with them out in public at, at the tax booth where the, the Pharisees and all the religious gurus and leaders are like, what, who's, what is he doing? Not only is he associating with these guys, what is he doing? He, he's eating with them. He is sharing table fellowship, which in that day and time, even this day and time, when you have somebody into your home, not just when you take them out to Freddy's, but when you have somebody into the confines of your home and you cook a home-cooked meal, uh, home meal and, you, and you set the table out, and you have people in, and you tell stories, and you get to know one another, and the kids go out in the backyard and play, and you're just swapping stories. and get, It's an intimate time. But in this day and time, to share the table with someone was, was something that was a deep relational thing. This would have been absolutely scandalous. <laughs> and we see that the reaction of the Pharisees shows this in verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, so, so what are you catching about the Pharisees? It's kind of like they, they got the binocs, right? They're, they're, they're watching Jesus, then they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. He's talking to Matthew. That, that, that guy's a, a scumbag. He took 10% he took off the top of my last year's taxes. Obviously, he doesn't know, you know, we need to go inform him. He's, he's, a, he's gross. He's an icky sinner. We don't, we don't relate to those people. He's going to, what is he doing? And then they pull the binoculars out again, and they're like, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa you seeing this? Matthew's leaving the tax booth. They're, make, 
They're going to Matthew's house. Look at what the Pharisees say in verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples. Why, why are they talking to his disciples? I think they're talking to his disciples because they're, they're trying to draw the disciples away. They're trying to cast doubt in the minds of the disciples. You know who this guy is? You're leaving everything for this guy who doesn't even know Psalm 1, evidently. Blessed is the man who walks, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat, in the seat of scoffers? You're following this guy who doesn't even follow one of the, the clearest teachings of Psalm 1. He sits and he eats with sinners. In verse 12 says, Evidently, they were close enough. I don't know if they were peeking through the window. I don't know. Verse 12 says, But when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. You see, the Pharisees, they thought that they were the spiritually healthy ones. They were the law keepers. They were the God-fearers. They were the ones who had it all together. They were the extra, super holy people. And they made sure everybody knew about it. And though they appeared to be the extra, super holy people on the outside, on the inside, they were sick. Not just sick, they were desperately sick. They just didn't see it. And the same is true of Pharisaical people today. Pharisa Pharisaical people who even exist within the confines of the church today. So Jesus says to him, note, says to them in verse 13, look there, he says, go and learn what this means, which I don't know if you're catching it, that would have been a very gentle, no, probably a, a it would have been taken as a slap in the face to the Pharisees. Because who are the Pharisees? They're the most educated and learned people in the room. And Jesus says, you need to go and learn something. You don't understand what the Old Testament says about sin. You don't understand what it says about the coming Savior. You don't understand. Go and learn, he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That is a quote from Hosea chapter 6 which is a book of the Old Testament that is all about the mercy of God. And Jesus basically says, you don't know your Old Testament. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus looks at him and he says, look, you guys have missed it. I, I didn't come to call the self-righteous or the self-sufficient or the superficial or the extra, super, squeaky clean, holy people. I came for people like this. For that guy over there who's passed out on the couch. For those guys over there that you wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. I came for these people. I came for sinners. For those who do not have their act together. For those who are broken and messy, for those that you would despise and avoid. And before we're too hard on the Pharisees, because aren't we pretty hard on the Pharisees? Before we're too hard on the Pharisees, let's just recognize the fact that there's a little bit of Pharisee in all of us. And if you're like, well, no, there's not. I'm, I'm not like that. That's probably actually showing you are. All of us, to some degree, are recovering Pharisees. We are. We are recovering Pharisees. We, we have sins that we elevate more than others. We have sins that are respectable and others that just how on earth could we shame on you? We tend to focus on the sins of others more than our own. 
There are people in our lives that we wouldn't say it verbally, but by the way we act and the people we hang out with, people are just, there's certain people that are just icky and, and gross. And you say, well, that's like childish terminology. Well, yes, I'm a dad. And say it, say it however you want to say it. But people that disgust you, people that you would never say it with your extra super holy, superficial mouth, and they're repulsive. You may never say anything about them out loud, but within the confines of your mind and even under your breath, they disgust you. And so I would just ask you, as one recovering Pharisee to another, who are those kind of people in your life? Who are the people that you're most tempted to despise and look down upon? The people that, if you were honest, they repulse you and disgust you. And as you think about who those people are, maybe you have your, their faces in your mind. Let me just remind you from this passage that those are the very kinds of people that Jesus would have hung out with and would have shared a meal with. Oh, that's, that's convicting. That's convicting. And w why, why would he do that? Because Jesus pursues sinners. Matthew's a testament to it. This Matthew's a testament to it. This Matthew's a testament to it. Matthew's friends are a testament to it. And guess what? You're a testament to it. Because like Matthew, Jesus pursued you when you, when you weren't looking for him. You say, well, I grew up in church. and No, 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 no. There is no one who is righteous. No one seeks after God, Romans 3 makes very clear. Like Matthew, you, you were sitting there in your sin, living for yourself and the things of this world. And Jesus came into your life when you weren't looking for him, and he issued the same simple, straightforward call to follow him. And when you made that decision, the Holy Spirit convicted you of your sin. And when you made that decision to repent of your sins, to, to close the ledger, to get up and to follow Jesus, it totally, like with Matthew, it totally changed your life. And all of that happened because of one foundational thing that this passage is just putting on emphasis. It all happened because Jesus pursues sinners. As he pursued you then, he continues to pursue sinners today. That's what Jesus does. He pursues sinners. It's what he's always done, and until he returns, it is what he will always do. So if we're going to be like our Savior, all of it, if we're going to be like our Savior, if we're going to have his mind and his heart and embrace his mission, then we are going to love and pursue sinners. So, Olivet, my plea for you and for me this morning is let's not be like the Pharisees. Let's not be like the Pharisees. Let's not think that we are better than anyone else. Let's not avoid people and ignore icky, sinful, gross, reviling people. And they are, and people are messy, just like you were messy. Maybe your messiness was here and of this flavor and their messiness is here or here and of this flavor. But instead of being like the Pharisees who were given to us as a contrast, let's be like our Savior. Let's love and pursue sinners. Let's be humble and patient and compassionate. Getting very practical, let's befriend them and let's eat with them. Let's have them into our home. 
And let's just remember that all of us are sinners in need of God's mercy and grace. Put very simply, let's be a church that loves and pursues sinners. Let's be a church that is like our Savior. I want to invite you to bow with me as I want to give us some time just to reflect on this passage. If you're like me and you caught from me when I try to really allow myself to reflect on this passage and this truth that our Savior loves and pursues sinners, it convicts me to my core. And my prayer for you this morning, my prayer for all of us this morning, is that Jesus would take some aspect of, of this passage, some aspect, some of the, something, some core truth here this morning, and would just do work in your heart. And I don't know what that may be, but I want to give you just some time to, with your heads bowed, just as the band plays, just to reflect and to consider, do I have this kind of heart and mind within me? Does this characterize me? Maybe even to get bold and to say, which of the two comparisons most describes me? The Pharisees? Or Jesus? And while I claim to follow Jesus, maybe my heart and my mind and my daily schedule would actually reflect that I'm more like the Pharisees. And maybe you need to pray about that. If you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, in a passage that is all about Jesus pursuing sinners, the one thing that I would say to you this morning is that the call of Jesus Christ for you today is the same simple, straightforward call that he gave to Matthew and that he gave to all of us in this room to follow him. And you, if you'd like to know more what it, about what it means to follow Jesus, because like there, like, it, like there was with Matthew, there are implications. There is a cost to following Jesus. I would love to talk to you about that. Let's take some time just to pray and to talk with the Lord. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. God, we thank you for that truth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that your heart is a heart for sinners. We thank you for the truth of, of the title that when you were here on earth that people gave to you to scorn you and to, to mock you, that you were a friend of sinners and tax collectors. And Father, I pray that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for all of us who are believers, all of us who profess to walk in the path of Jesus, I pray that you would really examine us this morning, that you would really help us to do a, a truthful examination of our hearts and our lives and to see, do our lives really line up with that of our Savior? Is our heart and our mind and our mission to see sinners pursued and saved for the glory of God, or for the advancement of the gospel? I pray that you would do real work real practical, concrete work that would, that would bring about concrete, practical 
implications and application in the life of our faith family that maybe this week or this month we will call up that neighbor that we've been knowing we need to have over for dinner. That we would reach out to this person or that person, Lord, that you've laid on our minds and, Lord, we've just frankly been a Pharisee about it. And that we would respond in faith and obedience, that we would follow the path of our Savior. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. And as we close out in song, what a, what a wonderful song to sing in response to this passage as we just meditate on and think about our wonderful Savior. Let's sing hallelujah, what a Savior.
Well, it has been a delight to enjoy Jesus together with you this morning. And uh, my wife is coming up here to say something. Okay, we'll go for it. Grab, grab a mic and do it. Grab a, a mic and do it. Just a very quick announcement about the women's retreat this coming weekend. Um, there's still time today is the last day to sign up because tomorrow I have to call and give numbers. Um, if you are a lady high school and up, you are welcome to join us. Babies are welcome. If, um, if you need to stay with your baby or bring your baby, that's welcome, of course. So um, if you can only come even Friday night or Saturday, um, Friday night we're going to start around 6. Saturday, we're going to go until 3. That is perfectly fine. Or if you're somebody that's like, I want to sleep in my own bed, that's fine too. Um, the Reed. retreat's in Valley Center. Sure. So um, it's easy for you to drive there and drive back. It's really close. So if you're only coming half the time, if you're only coming Friday or you're only coming Saturday, just note that on our sign-up list up here and on the blue offering envelope, just stick $25 in there and write Women's Retreat to help with meals. So even if you can't come the whole time, we'd love to have you. Um, if you are married and you're a husband, encourage your wife to come. Say, I'll watch the kids. It's no problem. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I just really hope you guys will come. We're having an excellent speaker out from First E Free, actually, who has been trained in the Simeon course that Matthew was talking about. Um, just excellent Bible teacher, rich time of fellowship with women. So. Um, if it sounds like I'm trying to drag you there, I'm really trying to drag you there. You're going to have a great time. I promise if you'll just get away that you will enjoy it. Um, so we'd love to see you there. If you have any questions, find me, and I can answer any questions about sign up. And if you've got some, some lame excuse about not sleeping in your own bed, let me just be the pastor dad and throw a pastor joke out there and say, uh, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. So you... You can definitely sleep in a retreat center uh, bed if Jesus can do that. All right, enough Pastor Dad jokes. Got